Despite his family's long tradition of military service, Joe Medicine Crow originally planned to enter academia. But when America joined World War II in 1941, Medicine Crow enlisted in the infantry as a scout, following in the footsteps of his step-grandfather. After World War II ended in 1945, he went on to become the Crow tribal historian and spent the rest of his life chronicling and retelling the history of the Crow people. So, today we're digging into the life and work of Dr. Joe Medicine Crow, the war chief who fought the Third Reich. But first, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. Then drop down in the comments and let us know which other historical figures' exploits you would like to hear about. Okay, time to find out what it takes to be a writer, historian, and a war chief. Joseph Medicine Crow was born in 1913 on a Crow Indian reservation near the town of Lodge Grass, Montana. His Crow name actually translates into English as high bird, as in a bird of great esteem. Not a really tall bird or a bird who never shows up to work on time. His father, Leo Medicine Crow, had risen to the level of war chief at the young age of 22. And his cousin, Pauline Small, was the tribe's first ever woman elected to public office. They overachieved in the Medicine Crow house. Perhaps Medicine Crow's most notable relative was his maternal step-grandfather. White Man Runs Him, a former scout for U.S. General George Armstrong Custer, who had been an eyewitness to the infamous Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876. By the 1870s, a number of Plains Indian tribes, including members of the Lakota Sioux, Northern Cheyenne, and Arapaho, had occupied and conducted raids in lands that had previously been claimed by, and recognized by the U.S. government as controlled by, the Crow tribe. The Crow, who had treaties with the U.S. government as far back as the 1850s, aided the U.S. Army in confronting their common foe in the Great Sioux War, also known as the Black Hills War. Custer, a U.S. Army officer who had notably served as a commander during the Civil War, was a lieutenant colonel by 1876, leading the 7th Cavalry of around 700 combined soldiers and scouts. In June of 1876, he plotted an attack on a Lakota settlement, but badly misjudged the size of the actual village. Scouts had estimated that there were no more than 800 hostiles in the area. But what they didn't know was that the Lakota ranks had swelled ahead of the summer buffalo hunt, and now numbered in the thousands. Classic Lakota. That is so them. Custer's estimates were so far off that prior to the battle, he was far more concerned that the enemy would potentially escape his grasp, rather than whether or not he would make it out of the fight alive. But that's exactly what happened. The fight was a resounding victory for the Lakota and Cheyenne, and ended with Custer getting smoked on a site appropriately now known as Custer Hill. Though his final moments are sometimes depicted in pop culture as a valiant last stand, many reports from eyewitnesses suggest that Custer and his men were overwhelmed quickly in a single charge, rather than dramatically fighting on to the last. There are also conflicting reports about the specific role played by Custer's Crow advisors during the battle, including White Man Runs Him. In one version, a legendary interpreter and guide named Mitch Bouillet personally dismissed the Crow scouts who had been working for Custer prior to the battle, with their work having been completed. In another version, White Man Runs Him and other Crow scouts remained at Custer's side throughout, providing strategic advice that the famed Lieutenant Colonel ignored. One anecdote claims that, when Custer's Crow advisors cautioned him against the battle, recognizing that they were pretty seriously outnumbered, he dismissed them as cowards and told them not to fight. Eh, that's one way to take advice. Little Bighorn went on to become one of the most talked about and storied battles in American history, making White Man Runs Him a sought-after interview subject for the rest of his life. In later years, when speaking to the press, his young relative, Joe Medicine Crow, would sometimes serve as an interpreter. In addition to hearing the history of his people directly from the source, Joe Medicine Crow also received his tribe's warrior training from his grandfather, Yellowtail. The rigorous exercises intended to toughen up young men included running barefoot through the snow and swimming in freezing rivers. It was training that would serve Medicine Crow well years later during his military service, and also any time he went from the hot tub directly back into the pool. Medicine Crow's childhood coincided with a particularly difficult period in his tribe's history, 
By the early 20th century, the total crow population was down to around 2,000 people, with their ranks having been devastated not just by disease and hunger, but by the forced relocation of young people to government-run boarding schools. These so-called residential schools were first established in the colonial period, with the express goal of civilizing Native American children. Their tactics were harsh and unforgiving, and it's been found that a number of indigenous children sent to these schools were subjected to all manner of abuse, and many succumbed to injury, infectious diseases, and malnutrition. Medicine Crow grew up with his tribe, but later recalled the brutal conditions the crows were facing in a memoir, noting, we were down to our lowest ebb, and he didn't mean it was time for a beer run. He recalled relatives stealing cattle in order to survive. But he was encouraged by relatives and tribal elders to pursue an education at all costs. After graduating from Linfield, a liberal arts college in Oregon, Medicine Crow moved on to the anthropology department at the University of Southern California and went on to become the first ever member of his tribe to obtain a master's degree. His thesis looked back at the history of interaction between Crow Indians and European settlers and went on to become a frequently cited and well-respected work. Medicine Crow planned to continue his studies and obtain a PhD, but never completed the coursework due to the onset of World War II. That war really messed things up for a lot of people, if we're being honest. Around this time in 1941, he was hired to consult on the Errol Flynn film, They Died With Their Boots On, a fictionalized retelling of the Battle of Little Bighorn. Ultimately, he was dismissed from the project by the production team, fueling a lifelong desire to tell the story for himself in a way that got the details right. In 1964, Medicine Crow wrote a treatment for a Custer film, and while his script has never been produced, it's still used by battle reenactors and hobbyists to this day. In 1941, Medicine Crow took a defense industry job at the naval shipyards of Bremerton, Washington. The following year, he enlisted in the U.S. Army, where he served as a scout in the 103rd Infantry Division. In combat, Medicine Crow famously wore his tribe's traditional war paint under his uniform, two red stripes on each arm, along with a sacred yellow painted eagle feather, which had been provided to him by a medicine man. Over the course of the war, Medicine Crow completed all four tasks, also known as coups, that earns a Crow tribe member the status of war chief. These include taking an enemy's weapon, leading a successful war party, stealing an enemy's horse, and touching an enemy combatant without killing him. Try that, it really annoys them. In other words, Medicine Crow was pretty good at warfare. While the 103rd was moving across France toward Germany, they came to a 400-mile-long series of defensive fortifications known as the Siegfried Line. The Germans didn't call it that, they just called it the West Wall. But the more colorful name inspired a British music hall song. We're going to hang out the washing on the Siegfried Line. Eh, maybe he had to be there. Medicine Crow was a scout, which meant he wasn't typically a frontline combatant, but he was still part of a group that had been ordered to ferry much needed explosives to the Siegfried Line, where they would be used to punch a hole in the German defenses in the way that only explosives can do. Ultimately, Medicine Crow received a bronze star for his role in the campaign, and for the Crow's elders, it also satisfied the leading a war party requirement. And what about that horse stealing requirement? Well, during a nighttime scouting mission, he discovered a farm that the SS had been using to stable its horses. Stealthily sneaking by the guards, Medicine Crow managed to mount one horse while leading more than 50 others back to the Allied camp, shouting a traditional Crow honor cry as he rode. Presumably, he waited until he was out of earshot. It had been several generations since the tribe had honored anyone with the title of War Chief. Medicine Crow himself didn't even realize he had earned the title until returning home from the war and speaking with his tribal elders about his experiences. As of 2023, Joe Medicine Crow is still the most recent member of his tribe to have earned the distinction. Following the war, Medicine Crow returned home to the U.S. and was appointed the Crow tribe's official historian and anthropologist. He also began a long tenure on the tribe's educational commission. For a time, Medicine Crow kept much of the tribe's history in boxes in his house and garage. Man, makes you wonder where they were keeping them before. We also know many of the specifics about Joe Medicine Crow's wartime experiences because of his participation in The War, a seven-part miniseries on the subject by acclaimed documentarian Ken Burns. Upon completing the film in 2007, Burns recalled that he'd wanted to tell Medicine Crow's story on film for the past 20 years. Listen, 
It takes Ken Burns a long time to do things. Have you seen his Civil War documentary? Madison Crow continued writing and lecturing until his death in the year 2016 at age 102. Though he never formally completed his PhD studies, he received honorary doctorates from Rocky Mountain College and Bacon College, along with both of his own alma maters. In addition to his Bronze Star in 2008, Madison Crow also received the French Legion of Honor Chevalier Award for his World War II service. In 2009, Barack Obama presented him with the Presidential Medal of Freedom the United States' highest civilian honor, awarded to such notable figures as Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Martin Luther King Jr., and Richard Petty. During the ceremony, the president used a bit of the Crow language, referring to Medicine Crow as a good man in his own tongue. Thanks, Obama. So what do you think? Did you find the story of Dr. Joe Medicine Crow's life inspiring? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.